restoring an old retro PC, you may want to watch this video first. In this video, I restore a retro PC with some difficulty along the way. Many don't understand the pitfalls of doing this without some experience. This is Trollbender with Trolls Tech, and last year I found an old $39 PC from 1998, a sweet Pentium 2 slot 1 266 MHz. It was the perfect specimen to relive some glory days. In the late 90s, early 2000s, I built hundreds of PCs on both factory assembly lines and in computer shops. This old thing reminded me a lot of those days. The shape it was in showed I had my work cut out for me. I thought it would be as simple as taking it all apart, cleaning all the parts thoroughly, disassembling the case, cleaning, sanding, and finally painting the case, and then putting it all back together for that satisfying sound of boot beep and floppy clicks and the grinding hard drive noises. But it didn't go smooth at all. And let this be some words of wisdom for others out there wanting to dive into retro builds. The very first issue I encountered was my monitor didn't support the ancient refresh rates of this old video card. My VGA to HDMI adapter wasn't helping. Luckily I had an older monitor and VGA cable to quickly solve the issue. So I ordered some USB to PS2 adapters and five days later the adapters came and I eagerly plugged in the keyboard and booted it up. Fail. The adapter did not work and I was left again with a PC I could not control. This is the part where I realized that it was set to PS2 only. I had to order a PS2 keyboard and mouse to solve this issue. I also ordered a new old stock IDE hard drive, 80 gigs, and 384 megs of memory while I was at it. Five days later. With the new keyboard and mouse in hand, I again booted up the PC and was finally able to explore and configure the BIOS. The first thing was to enable USB input device support in case I somehow lose my PS2 keyboard and mouse. My next hurdle was how to get an OS on this thing. I had four options as I thought, USB boot, CD-ROM boot, network boot, or floppy disks. The machine would not boot to any CD I put in it. It would not allow a boot to USB of any kind. Something was very wrong with the network card, so no network booting, and I had no floppy disks laying around and no way to get anything on one if I did. Fail. This was all just slightly frustrating. Back to Amazon for some more money spending. I purchased a USB floppy drive, a USB CD burner, and blanks for both. New old stock floppies came in a sealed box from 2006. I hope the lifetime warranty still holds up on that. Four days later. Finally armed with a way to get MS-DOS onto floppies, I plugged the USB drive in and... Shit. While the floppies were pre-formatted, Windows 11 did not like reading or writing to them consistently, or at all in some cases. When it did finish, I'd get garbage files. It was just lovely. How was I going to get a bootable floppy from this situation? After an hour of frustration, I connected the USB floppy drive to a slower USB port than the USB 3.0 I was using, and immediately things got better. Windows recognized the USB drive as a floppy drive and not whatever it was doing before. Now to get an image written to this floppy. I tried several programs with no success. Windows just did not want to correctly write to these 18-year-old disks. Then I found RawWrite. This tiny app was actually able to write the MS-DOS floppy images to my disks with no issues at all. Finally, I was getting somewhere. So I shoved my floppies into the 26-year-old drive and loaded up MS-DOS 6.22. At this point, I thought that most of my bugs would be over and out of the way. Everything went fairly smooth at that point and I was excited to configure device drivers after a flawless DOS install. This was the point it all started going downhill again. After a reboot from the DOS install, I was greeted with beeping sounds and IRQ errors from the network card. Usually this means it needs to be moved to another slot to properly get its resources. I tried that and had the same issues. No settings in the BIOS helped either. Finally, I just removed the network card for the time being to focus on sound, mouse, and CD-ROM drivers. With the network card out, I began to configure the rest of the peripherals. I got the CD-ROM drivers loaded easily with this disk image I found, 
Then came the mouse drivers and another problem. Something was wrong with the system again. Every time I hit the arrow key more than once, the computer would crash, hard lock, and give me the useless halt error. I thought maybe it was a keyboard issue, but my USB keyboard did the same damn thing. This made it impossible to code the autoexec.bat and config sys files, the very files I need to load the mouse and sound drivers into DOS. After a couple of days of trying different things, including removing the sound card, trying my spare USB keyboard, trying different settings in the BIOS, and playing with memory settings in DOS, I was stuck. After more staring, I guessed it may be a bad motherboard, bad PCI slots, or a bad video card. So I pulled the video card and examined it closely, noticing that there was a partially blown capacitor. Eureka! The card was most likely the culprit. So back to eBay, I found another AGP video card to try it out. Six days later. With the new card in, I was able to get through the editing of the system files with no issue at all. We now had a working keyboard and mouse with no system crashing. Holy f Lastly, we needed some sound. I examined the sound card and saw no physical issues, so we put the card in and configured the system files and drivers, and... Nothing. The system did not see the sound card. No matter what slot I put the damn thing in, it didn't work. I was convinced I had another bad card at that point. More money spending, and in comes a Sound Blaster Live. Hoping this will solve my last issue, I popped the card in, and... Nope. DOS did not recognize the sound card. Yay. It was at this point that I decided to take a step back. I decided that Windows would tell me what was wrong better than DOS would at this point. Into my CD archives to look for Windows 98, I found two burns. Neither worked in the 25-year-old CD-ROM. I tried burning fresh CDs from official images and nothing. So, back to eBay to find original discs and spend more money. Unfortunately, the seller was less than honest and I ended up with more burned CDs. None of which worked. None of it. None of it. Brock, Brock none, of none of it. None of which worked on my stone-aged CD-ROM reader. I needed an original press disc. After nearly two weeks of searching for an original Windows 98 CD that wasn't $60, I finally got a winner. A sealed copy of Windows 98 and a boot disk to boot. But the problems did not stop. Windows 98 would not get through an install without crashing or hard locking at some point during the process. I replaced the power supply hoping that was it. Nothing. With not much else left to pull from the case, I was left with memory. Memtest would literally crash on loading, so I pulled all the RAM sticks except for one and tried the Windows 98 install again. Still crashed. I tried a different stick and got the same result. The annoyance was high with this machine. I tried a different memory slot and one stick of RAM. This time, I got all the way through the install. Oh my god, I was getting somewhere. Windows 98 finally installed. I had a bad RAM slot on this board and bad video card. Everything else should now go a lot smoother, I would think. Now how to go about getting video, network card, and sound drivers on this thing. The network card was the easiest as the drivers fit on a floppy and I had that hardware. The video and sound drivers were going to be a small challenge. I had no blank CDs to write to as I used up the five pack I bought troubleshooting so I had to do this with the network. Getting Windows 11 to talk to Windows 98 is actually pretty easy. It's just a quick install of SMB 1.0 and whack whack the IP address of the Windows 98 share and you're in. I'm happy to say the machine is finally done working and working flawlessly. And yes, it runs Doom just great. Stick around to the end of the video to see some Redneck Rampage and a couple other games you might recognize on this old thing. I'm not happy to say that this brought back a lot of flashbacks of the years I did this for a living in 1998. Back then, standards were just being agreed on and incompatibility was the black plague of PCs at the time. USB was brand new and buggy as I worked at a shitty computer store where the cheapest parts were what we had in stock and getting those parts to work together was a literal brain surgery at times. We had to make our own drivers to get some of this crap to even work. Via PC chips and some generic sound cards were 
the worst of the culprits. That being said, this build was both a joy and a major pain in my ass. My wallet suffered as well. I'm not sure I'll venture back down the retro road I helped pave again. So let this be somewhat of a warning. Today's PCs are like putting together a five piece Lego set. Retro PCs can be a thousand piece puzzle that you may not easily solve without experience or a lot of research. In hindsight, I assume that none of the parts in this relic were bad. When you buy 20 plus year old parts, always assume one thing is going to be a problem and test ahead of time if you can. This has been Trollbender for Trolls Tech. Thanks so much for watching. If you have questions about your retro build, feel free to ask in the comments below. I'll put links below too to the useful tools and apps I used and finally tackle this beast. Thanks so much for watching. I love you guys. Goodbye. Yep. Code Delta 9. Freeport.
Sword City back.